Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which, which part of the world you're tuning in from today. Thanks for sharing your time with us. We hope everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, so on today's Trimble Stratus webinar, we'll be discussing how waste management operations can improve their safety and efficiency with drone operations. We're live here with folks spread across the globe. Today we have Kevin Smith from, from Propeller joining us all the way from Geelong, a lovely city just southwest of Melbourne in Australia, and then Jim Greenberg from Trimble, who's based in Boulder, Colorado. I'm Kelsey Saya, also based in Colorado, just a bit south of Boulder in Denver. Next slide, Jim. So on today's webinar, we're gonna go through a couple of different things. First, uh, Jim and Kevin are gonna introduce themselves. They're today's subject matter experts. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about where the waste management industry has come from and what the future of it looks like. Then we'll dive right into the hardware. We'll talk a little bit about drones and how they're a new tool in the toolbox. We'll touch a little bit on tracking progress and productivity and how uh, drones can really help you improve that airspace management. Then we'll touch on saving money on compliance reporting. And then we'll take a final look at the tech integrated landfill. And then at the very end, we will do a live Q&A. So if you've got questions, please feel free to drop them in the questions tab. Over to you, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, let me turn on my camera for a minute here. Uh, so my name is uh, Jim Greenberg, and I am a uh, product manager for landfill and uh, UAS in the heavy civil or civil engineering construction division of Trimble. Um, in my role, I am responsible for how the Trimble tools are applied to the landfill. So that includes uh, UAS, uh, GNSS rovers, um, machine control for compactors, and also machine control for uh, for uh, dozers. So um, indicate systems, 3D control systems. Um, my background, I'm a surveyor, so I kind of go at the landfill from a, a survey perspective. And um, the tools that we have uh, really give great insight to a landfill um, and they allow the uh, landfill operator um, to do their own surveying and make their own measurements and uh, answer their own questions based on having accurate data. And so uh, it's a it's a really great um, industry, I think. It's super interesting. Uh, it's going through a real transition, uh, I believe, you know, where everyone's starting to really take advantage of uh, data. And so that's uh, what I've been focusing on for a while here is, is what kind of data can we generate on a landfill that can then can help to uh, improve operations and uh, get the most value out of the airspace that a landfill has. So that's my background and uh, my focus. And I'll hand over to Kev now. Uh, next, uh, next slide, Jim. Thanks. Okay, I'll turn on my camera as well. Hopefully you see me. Hi guys. Um, yep, my name's Kevin Smith. I'm the regional sales manager here in Australia and the greater region. Um, my background is a surveyor, same as Jim. I um, worked on lots of um, mines, roads and landfills and for the last probably 15 years worked around the machine control side of things with um, Caterpillar and also now with Propeller um, and yeah spent a lot of time with technology on landfills working with landfill managers and how to improve the efficiency and safety of the landfill so let's take it away Jim okay okay so like Jim mentioned just before the the way landfills operate and not just landfills it's pretty much the whole earth moving industry from mining civil um and landfills the way they operate has changed for good um, and that's actually because of data and the technology now harnessing data it's good having data but it's no point in having data for data's sake so we're there to try and make that data actually meaningful for you on a landfill the way data has changed it's pretty much because mobile phones and everyone now has access to instant data. So that's what the, the mindset of people on landfills and the way we've seen it over the last 15 years has changed from looking there outside your door to actually looking at the data of what's happening and how can i improve my landfill 
Okay, next one, Jim. So, landfill data capture evolution, and I'll discuss this with Jim, but early 90s, as you can read, you know, we had machine hours, we had fuel, and we had manual survey. So, that's myself and Jim walking around. You guys probably would have seen, you know, you'd have them on your sites right now, walking around, even probably not with a GPS rover then, but with a GPS rover in the late 90s. Then we get into the Weybridge quarterly flyovers with a pine, getting a bit of data, but basically just having that aerial image of your landfill and surveying for densities, more for compliance and actually performance. Then as we breach into the 2000s, we're looking at machine control slowly coming in and compaction technology, uh, the old CAT CAS system that I installed years ago now, that's actually been around since like the mid 2000s, early 2000s. So um, landfill technology and probably, how do you see it, Jim? Like hasn't changed much for 20 odd years, 15 years? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, we've been collecting data with machines uh, on landfills, as you say, for a long time. What really kind of brought me to the landfills was the UAS. I had been doing machine control and other applications, but um, the the ability or the complementary nature of drones to machine control, uh, I think is really interesting, right? Like when we were doing machine mapping in the past, uh, it was hard to know if you had a complete picture, right? There's there's value that can be gained from machine systems, but the value isn't in the whole picture. So we had these tools that were really valuable to the field. And now that we have the drone, in addition to machine control, we can give data to a lot more people. So I think that, um, you know, the, the drone hasn't necessarily uh, changed what we're, doing with machines and rovers and surveying in the field, but it's given us great insight to what's going on, right? It's it's this tool now that we can go out and, and gather mass amounts of data with very little effort and answer all kinds of questions with that data. So um, yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah. just, yeah, starting to change, I'd say in the last few years, a lot. Yeah, it's that one piece that turns it into the whole site management tool as opposed to little bits here and there across the job site. Yes. Yep. All right. Next slide. Yep. Okay, so the new tool in the toolbox, I think you're going to do this one, Kev, right? Yeah. Or was so, me? That doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah. We can both do it. Well, okay, so the, sorry, that was me, my mistake. Um, so, you know, drones, that's what we're really here to talk about today. And, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of hype about drones in the last, you know, five years or so. Uh, and this slide's just showing how, you know, in the beginning we had these great expectations out of what a drone would do, right? They'd put surveyors out of business, they'd do all these things, right? And, and as time's gone on, you know, people have started to realize that, okay, a drone is a tool. And what can we do with that tool, right? So the expectations of, you know, people that might not have known so much about surveying was it'll do all these things, right? But the in the beginning, the drones were kind of expensive, uh, not extremely accurate. Uh, you know, in the right hands, you could get amazing results out of a drone. But, um, you know, they were they were very complicated. You know, they were... They were kind of uh, low production numbers, uh, really kind of high tech devices that were, were needed to, to um, uh, capture this data. So as time's gone on, you know, our expectations have got more reasonable. Uh, the capabilities of the drones have gotten better, right? Uh, the drones started coming down in price. We were looking at, you know, fixed wings versus multi-rotors. There were all kinds of discussions around which one was best. Um, but now we've reached a point, you know, in the last uh, couple of years where DJI has come out with some really quality, with some drones that we can get really quality data out of that aren't very expensive. And so 
back in 2018, which is not that long ago, um, we were relying on uh, a drone, which was the Phantom 4 uh, Pro. And that was just a, a good drone. It cost about $1,500. Uh, it had a reasonable camera on it, and uh, if we put down enough ground control, we could get really great results out. Um, but the problem was that you needed someone that understood ground control and where it needed to be applied, and uh, also you needed to have access to your site to put in ground control everywhere that you needed it in order to get an end product that was really, you know, reliable and, and usable. So we still had uh, a lot of um, expertise needed. And it wasn't until just in November of uh, 2018, I believe, that DJI came out with this drone, uh, which was the, uh, oh, we're not there yet, which was the Phantom uh, RTK. And so what I'll show in the next slide after the poll is this drone's really revolutionized things for us, right? It's got a reasonable price point. Uh, it's got higher accuracy GPS in it. It's got a quality camera. And now, you know, in 2019, 2020, what we want to get out of drones and what we are getting out of drones are really aligned, right? With minimal effort, we're getting great results out of uh, these drones. And so, um, we're really, you know, just within a year, I'd say, of this being, you know, a, a technology that's accessible to everyone. And we'll talk some about the workflows that we have that that uh, that make that so in in a little while. So, are we ready for the poll question now? Can we do that or uh, poll question? Um, yeah, we've got a poll. Uh, the poll open is on. Should be on your side. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yep. There we go. Okay. Um, have your drone operations been impacted by COVID? So, just click on the poll. You should be able to see it. Um, and then just click, and away you go. So, just let us know your thoughts on that one. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we have thirty-six percent voted. Yep, there we go. So no impact so far, that's good. I'd say landfills will still have trash coming in. Some been stalled and some have been grounded. Okay, that's good to know. All right, next one, Jim. All right. Okay, okay. so are we good? Are you seeing the drone in the arrow point now? Yep. Oh, okay. So on the left is this drone I was talking about, which is the Phantom 4 RTK. And you can see on top of the drone, there's this little uh, hat or a little cap. And that's actually a high accuracy uh, GPS. And if you go out and look at drones, some will be cheaper uh, and they might not have that capability. And this capability to um, collect high accuracy GNSS data uh, is really key to getting quality outputs from from the system um, so on the right we have what's called an arrow point and an arrow point is an aerial target so that means that the drone when it's flying takes pictures and we can see that target and we can use that target as a reference point but the other thing about this target is that it's actually a gps receiver and it's logging gps data and so um, by what's called post-processing we can determine the position of that target within you know a centimeter and so when the drone flies we have a target on the ground uh, those are both logging gps gps data and we can do what's called post-processing to get very accurate it's called photo centers which are are the coordinates where the drone was when it took the picture and that means that we get great consistency from our inputs and therefore we get really robust outputs. And so these two things are key to um, our solution that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, the Phantom 4 RTK drone and the Aeropoint from Propeller. So Kev, you wanna talk about the software a bit? Yeah, so we'll go through some of the tools on the software, but basically, it all ties in hand in hand. We've actually made the workflow for the hardware and the error points. So the error points are Wi-Fi, so you don't really have to do any downloads. And 
for the software side of things, to actually create a full 3D model, all you need to do is take your card out of the drum and you upload it straight into our software. So as long as you can copy and paste, you can basically create a full 3D model. It's about 10 minutes of your time to actually process the data. Um, I guess the cloud. Yep. Go, Jim. Yeah, one thing I was going to say is, you know, so the drone really is a survey tool, and what we've done in this process is eliminated almost all sources of error, right? So we've streamlined the process and eliminated, you know, everything that we could, so that there's very few places that that a user can make mistakes, and and they always get what they want out of the back end. So um, it is a uh, it is a really complicated tool that we've really made quite simple. And the software's key to that and the hardware's key to that, those two things combined. Yeah, definitely. They certainly go hand in hand. And we have lots of landfill managers around the whole world um, using this solution to actually capture their own landfill. So, okay. Next one. Okay, so to get back, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but what is PPK? And PPK is really the the key to why we're getting consistent results out of this drone. Um, and what's happening is uh, when you're civil engineer or you know anyone doing you know engineering work on your landfill, right? They're working on a coordinate system, and so what we do is we take an arrow point and we put it on a known point within your uh, landfill and then you fly the drone uh, and the drone can actually fly you you program in the uh, flight path but the drone actually does its own flying you you don't have to uh, do anything more than uh, tell the drone to launch the drone flies its pattern you need to keep an eye on it and make sure that everything's safe and then the drone will come back and land itself well while the drone's flying the target on the ground on a known point is logging data and the drone itself is logging data and then when the mission's done uh kev mentioned earlier wi-fi right um the target has the ability to upload its data through wi-fi to the propeller servers where it can be post-processed relative to the drone so we have this target on a known point we have a drone on an uh, that's flying Basically, it's a GNSS rover. And when we take the data from the target and we take the data from the drone and we post-process that, we get a very accurate trajectory for where the drone was when it took a picture. And that means that when we go to process this or run through the photogrammetric process, which gives us these 3D maps that we want out the far end, we can basically treat each image as a control point and so we get this really robust uh, model and then having the arrow point on a known point on the ground we shift the whole robust model that we've created relative to the site and usually it's only a tweak of a few centimeters but makes it so that we get really accurate results really robust and uh, you know not to harp on the point too much but um, if you're looking at drones PPK is is a uh, key to getting consistent results um, out of uh, photogrammetry. Do you want to add anything to that Kev? I um, now nailed it that's that's definitely, we've seen a huge, vast improvement over the three years that I've been here on just the, con the consistency of the surveys going through. You know, we are getting down to that three centimeter accuracy, so the one inch across your whole job. Yeah, yep. and, and you know, just back to that expectation slide, right? Like I just, I think it's phenomenal to the results that, that drones are capable of uh, delivering is, is really quite impressive. Um, you know, that uh, we can fly it, you know, 100 meters and, and get, you know, three centimeters on the ground is is pretty amazing, really. But that's uh, what we get. And we do, you know, I, I never like to say this is how good the system is. Uh, we also have within the software uh, the ability to set checkpoints. And so for every mission that, that a user flies, they could set checkpoints. And then those checkpoints can, they can get a report on those checkpoints relative to the end result. So you can set points of known coordinates that you don't use in the processing that you use to check the output in the end. So there's lots of uh, good detail within the software to, to really help uh, users have confidence in um, what they're doing. So it's not, you know, you don't have to take our word for it that what, what you're getting out of it is, uh, you know, um, 
is this accurate, right? You can you can prove that to yourself very easily, and we give you the tools to prove that to yourself. Okay, so with all the tools that we've just shown you and the software, basically what at Stratus and what the software tries to do and what it, it is completely focused on is just answering these uh, five questions. So progress, productivity, quality, cost, and safety. And all the tools, it's not complicated at all. It's basically designed to answer, where am I up to now? How fast am I going? Am I getting the quality? Am I matching design? Now, and all that leads to cost. And safety is a big one with a drone. You don't need anyone walking around your landfill. Right? It's you can fly these from you know, a kilometer. You, know, you can actually be at the site office and fly the drone. You want to be near a high point, but you do not need anyone around any of those machines. So straight away, you're eliminating that safety risk. Um, and you're capturing the entire site in what could be you know, 30 minutes, 20 minute flight. So, um, we'll show you some of the tools, um, but basically the tools are all in the software designed just to answer these. It's really uh, landfill focused. Okay. Um, yep. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the actual software. This is just a GIF of the software. It's a 3D, full 3D interactive model. And straight away on a landfill, you know, the main things, a couple of main things that you want to know is your density and how much volume you've put in there every month or whenever you decide to fly. So we answer that question very simply. We draw a box around the area or you can actually have your cell boundary imported in. We calculate just a simple measurement between the survey to survey. It tells you how much volume has been placed there and what you can see there, the blue is where more material has been placed, the lighter blue is where it's less placed. Gives you a volume um, of what we put down, but because we know the volume, there's then a simple tool, we just turn on a calculator, which is down the bottom left. You enter your tons from your scale house or your waverage, and that directly gives you your density because we know the volume, we know the tons across the wave bridge for the same time. Simple calculation gives you your density figure. Exactly. And this gives you the ability, as um, one landfill manager did tell me, because they're doing they do it themselves, it is it demystifies the mystic art of surveying. Like you can actually see how these values are calculated, where the material has been placed, where it's come from, and not only that, where that density calculation is coming from. It's not just a bit of paper from a surveyor. You can actually control that and do it yourselves. We do have lots of surveyors doing this as well. So doing this and handing it to the landfill. So it works both ways because the landfill guys can now see what the surveyors are doing as well. So it's it's a really good collaborative thing that we've got going and it's all, um, you know, web-based so you can share this data around. Okay. And I guess I'd make one comment just because when I was looking at this. So we make, uh, really, we have filters where you can say, you know, take out the vehicle. So by, uh, by algorithms knowing, you know, kind of the shapes or the, the way things, uh, you know, we wouldn't expect a cliff, something, you know, similar to a, a semi tractor trailer right so we're able to take that volume out of the calculation um, by by filtering the data but we also uh, give the user the ability to take out different things if they wanted to such as a stockpile um, so you really you do have control over exactly what's measured yeah that's a good point next slide Jim okay so from the exact same uh, information where we've just calculated our density, in the exact same measurement, we can also calculate the remaining tonnage because we can enter in or we can upload designs. So we know we can upload either the top of the lift or the actual final top of waste. And because we've got that calculator and you can see on the left there, I just click tonnage and if you enter, we know the volume then, which is remaining, which is your remaining airspace. 
we can very easily just type in your target density or even the density that we just calculated above and that will give me how many tons are remaining which is a very handy feature because if you know how many tons are coming across your way bridge you can then work out how long um, that cell has got remaining in its life because you know the tons remaining you know how many tons are coming in very simple calculation to work out how long you've got left on that cell so you can actually use that to you know make decisions on when to start new cells when you need to bring contractors in when to bring civil guys in all sorts of information and that can be all done in that same um, calculation as the density you didn't give the truckload of mattresses uh disclaimer though but ah yes apart from the truckload of mattresses <laughs> okay yeah. next slide yep okay so this is uh an example that i have of a, a landfill that uh, i've been tracking working with and tracking for a while and so what we have here is uh, on this landfill, they have machine control. And in order to make machine control work, uh, the machines that are out in the field have a 3D model in them. So they know, um, you know when they're reaching the top of a lift, when they're reaching the edge of a design, you know, a sloped area. And so what I'm showing here is that I can take all the designs that uh, are going to be on the machine and I can put them all into the portal. So that means that as Kevin was showing, you know, density calculations or airspace remaining calculations, I can do those relative to any design. So I can do them relative to a lift is what I usually do, right? How much time do we have left in this lift? And so you can put this in as a DXF file or you can put it as a, in as a TTM file, which is a Trimble um, surface model for a machine or for a rover. And then what, the drivers in the operators in the field are seeing, the surveyor in the field is seeing on their equipment is exactly what we're seeing uh, in the office when we do a flight. So it's uh, it's really consistent across the different platforms. So same designs in Stratus, same designs in Trimble Business Center, uh, GCS and Earthworks in the field, uh, SiteWorks on the rover. So everyone's sharing the same data. Um, another thing that I found was really great about uh, being able to put the designs into the uh, platform, not so much on this cell right here because it's a brand new cell, but we did put a lift uh, a little bit uh, more towards the center of the screen, kind of capping the existing landfill. And when the civil sent the design uh, for the machines, what we found was that there was like a three foot cliff on the, uh, you know, it daylighted three feet above the surface. And the reason being that, um, you know, the whole landfill had settled. And so, you know, rather than having to get a surveyor out there to survey the whole landfill, we just took the export of Stratus, which was a DXF file or a point cloud, gave that to the civil engineer, and the civil engineer just readjusted the model to to sit on the new newly settled uh, area, newly settled cell. So what used to happen before machine control and all in this landfill is the operators would just deal with you know what they got uh and now you know they have better visibility with their rover and their machine in the field and better visibility with stratus you know uh it's pretty simple uh to see that the model didn't fit and now the process is okay well we need a new lift in this area it's probably settled let's take the last flight send that to the civil and then we get um models that fit so it's a it's a really great way to validate models as well because you don't have to load them into a machine or load them into a rover and walk the site. You can just drop them into the portal and see, you know, are they uh, sloping inside the liner, right? Things like that, really basic stuff, but saves you going out in the field. So yeah. um, that's, that's definitely really... happening for us here as well, Jim, in Australia. Exactly the same. So it's, yeah, it's good I point. mean, it, it's expensive to get it surveyed all the time. That you know that thoroughly so people just deal with uh what they have and so this now now they have what they need so it's really improves the process yeah nope oh, time for a poll question is that running yep, yep. okay the majority of your drone program okay this will be good let's see what's out there
And just a reminder, while this is running, if you guys have questions, feel free to pop them in that questions box and we'll get them answered at the end of the webinar. Okay, so about half of you are just researching. Um, okay, Kev, do you wanna make any comments on that? Is that what you were expecting? Yeah. Um... Yeah, probably. It's, you know, landfills from what I've seen is, yeah, a lot of people are getting it flown, but probably not by themselves. So just researching what's out there, what it can do is definitely something that, um, yeah, well, I expected to see. Okay. Okay. Um, just kind of continuing on with, uh, you know, the total landfill. Uh, this is that same landfill, just looking at it from a different direction and those same models. And so you can see that I've loaded uh, six models and a fluff lift in here. And those exist within the platform to make measurements too. Um, and I have loaded them all here. I don't have to load them all, but you can see that uh, I mean, that there's a dotted line and I know that that's the third lift. And so what I can see is, okay, well, we're currently working on the third lift, right? Just by running a cross section across uh, this and I can see, you know, high spots, low spots. Um, there's also another tool which we'll look at where I can look at the whole area, but the surface slicer tool is really great to, um, you know, see what the current um, elevation is relative to a, a cross section anywhere in the landfill. Um, I was really just trying to show that the models exist, even when you don't see them, they still exist in the background for measurement purposes. So you can always, you know, do a cross section, do an area somewhere, and you can bring up any model that you have loaded uh, to get um, a profile or, or a cut fill relative to that surface. I really like that slide, Jim. It looks really good. <laughs> it's a clear picture. So this is that same uh, landfill, and what we're seeing here is uh, that as we fly and we have these designs in here, we have another filter that's called uh, design to, or sorry, uh, current surface to design. And so all I've done here is I've chosen my different designs, uh, my lift. I don't think I chose my fluff or one because they didn't. They happened way too early, but you know, lift one, lift two. So this is lift two, and I can see it was completed in April 2nd. If you watch that graph across the bottom, you see how the lines are changing. The bottom line is cut and the top line is fill. So the fill, you can see, you know, how is the airspace for that lift burning down? So lift five has 64,000 cubic yards left. Lift, lift six has half a million cubic yards left. Um, if we go back here and now you see uh, this will be, I think, lift two. Lift two is actually, you know, the cut is now more than the fill. So what that means is we've pretty much completed that uh, that lift and we're starting to go into the lifts above it. So um, you, by loading multiple designs, you can actually see, you know, if say you're building in lift two, but you build a wet deck in lift three, right? You can still see what volume you have left in lift two. You could see what volume by overbuilding lift two, you've gone into lift three. So I really like to get multiple lifts loaded in for a landfill, whatever their fill plan's going to be. And then you can watch how, um, you know, the volume's moving through the different lifts. And, and see what airspace is left. And and that one, like, so you saw in lift five, there were 64,000 cubic feet left. I can then put a contour on that and I can see where that, uh, where that volume is. I could do a cross section, see where that volume is. I can do uh, a cut fill map and see where that is. So we have multiple ways of looking. Um, but my point here is like just having the designs in the portal gives you a lot of visibility into how the landfill is progressing. Um, this is a shot, just this is another function within the um, portal and it's a gradient map. So all I've done here is I've set the gradient to highlighting green when we're at a three to one slope roughly. And so if you look at this to the right hand side, this is a, you know, this landfill's 20 years old, I believe. So on the right-hand side, they built before they had machine control and they have settling. So we're kind of at a five to one slope. So 
we've lost a bit of airspace on, on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we all those slopes have been built with machine control. So they're all three to one slopes perfectly, or you know, within reason perfectly. Um, and so really great, you know, so the operators in the field have visibility to what they're doing. Um, and then by doing this, flying the, the site with Stratus, running a gradient map, the back office or operations can see exactly what's happened in the field, right? Have they realized all the airspace that they need to? Have they built to design? So, and we can do these tools in really small areas and try to answer really specific questions um, about things, but just a, a general view of what you can do with a gradient tool. But it's a really, uh, it's a pretty flexible tool to answer some questions. Um, this is just an example of uh, the timeline function. And so this was a landfill where they were doing some work with backhoe and they were worried that they breached uh, the liner. So what we did was we got that area, uh, did a little cut fill map, and we see that in the middle where there's no color, that means we're pretty much on grade. Um, and what I'm actually differencing here is I, this site's been flown when the liner still existed. So we, so documentation-wise, we flew it when the liner was there. And so you'll see now we can go back through time on the bottom. So we're in the middle of March now, and we'll go through, uh, you know, a couple of weeks previous, and you'll see how the landfill is progressing. There's a, there's an excavator doing some work down there. The public was loading from the bottom, but here this is going all the way back to when the landfill was built. And so because I dropped that point on the day that it looked like they had breached and I held that point all the way back to the as-built, I can then look and see exactly where that point is on the as-built. And what that does is they only breached it by like a 10th. So they barely nicked the top and then they saw it when they they nicked it, so they stopped. So it wasn't a big thing, but now when they go to repair it and we have that point and we have this as built, we can see exactly where that is relative to the liner. So we can see how far it is horizontally. I think it's about seven and a half feet. So we just do the horizontal measure tool from kind of where the, where the existing point is to um, where the liner is. So that's just a horizontal distance measuring tool. And then the other thing uh, after this one's complete is we can do a, a vertical difference. So we can see what the elevation difference is between the two. So how, how deep are we? So a half a foot down. Right, so this means that when they go to repair it, they know exactly what they're dealing with. They, you know, however they repair, whether they need to go to the edge or whether they, you know, just patch by patching in place, they now know exactly what they have to deal with. So a really valuable part of, uh, you know, flying at strategic times uh, is, is hopefully capturing data that might bring value uh, later on if there's any issues. Yeah, that's a great example. Jim was showing, volume tool the point tool and the timeline tool and bringing it all together to actually tell us a story of what's happened on that landfill. that's great yeah yeah you know i mean it's like cad right like you got certain tools and once you understand those tools you put them together in different ways and you can answer all kinds of things and and the tools are pretty straightforward so uh there's a lot you can do with them yeah great okay, okay. all right um so just going on from what Jim told, these are just the, the basic tools that are out there, but actually add a lot of value as well. So we've got um, just slope tools where we can measure the slope. This one will actually show the, the difference between the yellow line is the drone survey and the dotted line is the design. So we can actually see you know, how much we've got to go up the top and down the bottom, you can also see not only breaches but how much we've breached as well so a really good example of this is on a landfill where they did have machine control but what was happening is when i did a training session with a contractor and the client um what we could see was basically what you see on the left there the current surface was a meter below the design now Straight away, it was actually meant to be on design, 
the contractor said you're building it wrong and the client's going oh, the client was saying you're building it wrong the contractor's saying your design is wrong and there's a argument going between them for about 10 minutes i was sitting there wondering what's going on how's this going to be resolved and it ended up that um a guy after about 10 minutes walked in the room who was the supervisor for the client and said ah oh, I actually told them to do that, but I didn't tell them to do it. And it was, well, what do you mean? And because we could visually see, what he told them to do was the landfill and the slope was actually gonna run straight down onto one of their whole roads. So he wanted them to stay a meter off the road and a meter off the liner for a meter. So they'd have a meter section so that everything could run down into that. But what they actually did was stay a meter off the design because they had machine control so we had a meter gap all the way up for about 400 meters and it wasn't anyone's really mistake because it was just a miscommunication but that miscommunication actually led to about a million and a half dollars worth of missing airspace that they can't get back to for another couple of years now um so because of a result of that they actually fly the drone every two weeks now to actually keep an eye on it and the contractor themselves is doing that to make sure that they're doing the right thing the client can see exactly what the contractor is doing so they're all on the same page now and some of those miscommunication um issues uh, won't happen again so it's um a tool that because it can show the entire project it's something that um, is a really good collaborative tool between them uh, next slide jim um, this is another one just for basic tools that we've got just with through the platform um, on any landfill or the quarries or civil. It's basically just a stockpile tool. So we can go around, measure what our cover material is on that stockpile. And just a few simple clicks, it will actually give me the volume there. We can see there's nearly 1,129 cubes sitting in there. Now, where this comes in handy is we know how much cover material you've got on site. So another tool we've got is a surface area tool. So if you use that surface area tool across your working face and times that by the thickness of your cover material that you need, you've got a volume that you need and you've got the volume that you've got in stock. So you can work out whether you need to import material or whether you need to go and get some more or you've got enough on site. So it just becomes that whole site management tool, not just for your densities, not just for your volumes remaining, but you can use it to manage your entire site. All right, next one. Um, now, this is just a, an added benefit. We've got an elevation tool, which is basically just a contour map that you can overlay on your site. Now, the actual contours and the system itself is customizable. So by using a few little smarts on the system, we can actually see where water can be laying and ponding or where you can have breaches. So here we've got a settlement um, catchment at the bottom of the landfill. And if just say you had a big rain event or your pump failed, we can see there where, where it comes red. This is where it's good. And then we can add an extra elevation in to say, what if the water breached this elevation? And that's what we're seeing on the red. You'll see that it actually breaches the road and will run off site, which isn't very good for environmental and something that you can actually proactively do by building a, an extra bund just along that left-hand side of the uh, of that uh, drain there. So it can be used for many things. We've actually seen it on a site where we use the same exercise and you could actually see a temporary haul road that they'd built. Water was going to pond around that bottom um, area. And when we took a drive around the site, there was water ponding in that exact same area. So handy tool. Um, I was doing that from the office and telling them you'd have water ponding here. We drove out on site and there was water ponding there. So um, really easy to do without anyone actually having to get onto site as well. All right. Next one. And this is what just Jim just mentioned before, but just another way of doing it, going back in time between survey to survey. Now, where Jim used it to look at, you know, the liner and doing volumes, you can actually use it for, especially for environmental areas or proving work with contractors. 
you can go back in time and prove that things have changed or where they haven't changed um, and actually have a timestamp of when that change occurred. So as you can see there, the road is clear and when we start, we're actually breaching that road. So if you had changes in vegetation, you'd be able to check that as well by just going back with this visual record over time. All right, next one, Jim. Oh, another poll, here we go. Had you heard of Trimble Stratus before this webinar? Let's see. That's looking good. So we're looking like okay. here. Forty-four percent have are exploring the product. That's good to see. Um, some are interested, and there's a few who are current users, which is great. So hopefully you're learning something new as we go on through this as well. All right. So out of all those tools that we've just shown. Uh, what's the common thread there? So next slide, Jim. So this is where we tie it all together. So, you know, it's data for data's sake, but we've got that information gap, which has previously been there either between the client, the contractor, the surveyor, the landfill manager. You know, you get your volume and your density and from a surveyor's point of view, they hand you a form with a PDF with a report, but there's that information gap. Now with Stratus, because it's all web-based, all those measurements that I showed and Jim showed just then, they can actually just one click, you can actually share each measurement with whoever on the platform. It's web-based, you can all be looking at the exact same data at the same time, which is where the head office can come in and have a look at various sites wherever they are in the world contractors and especially clients can work together so that if a contractor is getting paid off volumes from the client you can actually share that and the contractor can see how they're getting paid which definitely stops a lot of disputes on site because now it's it's a two-way street you're working it's a partnership there and there you can actually see how things are getting done um the measurement tools like Jim showed, that visualization of where things have been breached, just the ability to show that to either the contractor, the client, or even the head office when things get delayed or a liner gets breached and broken and why they need to actually have funds, you can actually see it all in the one and share it around. So it also means you don't need as many personnel on site as well. So that collaboration, it's, it is that one shared source of truth. You got anything to add to that, Jim? No, I think that was, that was a good summary. Yep, perfect. All right, okay. next slide. So these are just some of the things that we can get out of the system as well, as well as sharing those things um, live on the site. We can create reports out of any of that information as well. So on the right-hand side, we've got our monthly density figure where we've got how much volume has been put in there and the volume, the density figures there is 0.813. We've got PDF or CSV. So CSV reporting means you can just put it straight into whatever, you know, it's an Excel form, so it can go to whatever normal reporting format you have on site. We've got monthly densities, lifetime cell densities. The bottom left down there actually shows a cut and fill report that um, we can create straight out of the site, um, out of the system as well. And We've also, you know, many sites use it for EPA compliance reports. So you can let them know how much volume's gone into your tip, what your slope angles are, whether they're conformed to the design, whether you've had breaches over the top of height, or whether you make you can make sure that you don't. And tip heights, if you've got regulations that you have tip heights, you know, you can't be over a certain elevation. Um, you can very simply and easily check that yourselves without having to get a GPS rover and someone out on site to actually do that for you so it's more about you managing the site yourself how about how about people you know like landfills lots of the operators and stuff they don't have a, a computer or anything can you talk about what we offer so that 
they can make the office aware of the current state kind of thing, the maps on walls stuff? Yeah, so part of the um, part of the system itself as well is there's a button where you can export a map. Now, you can export an AO map of the current um, aerial image, and you can actually overlay DXFs on that. So if you've got wells and um, underlying utilities, you can actually have them turned on, hit export map, and that can then go on your um, site office wall where everyone can have a view. So the site operations, uh, the operation team, like Jim just said, can have an actual, the latest aerial image on that wall as well, where they can all work off that same page. Instead of something that's like a Google Earth that's five years out of date, this can be you know from a week ago or yesterday. It's just a very quick click and print, basically. Yep. All okay. right. And next one. And okay. so, yeah, this is tying it all in and I'll let Jim run through, but basically this is the integrated tech. So a landfill with a drone is a good, great thing for reporting, but you're always gonna be after the fact. But there is definitely other tools to make that ultimate landfill um, work more efficiently. So do you wanna run through that, Jim? Yeah, I, you know, so just looking at the, the products and the landfill solution. Um, you know, we have landfills that choose all different combinations of equipment. Some, you know, choose Stratus and only a rover, which I think is an interesting combination for a smaller landfill, right? It gives them the ability to go out and lay out their plan with the rover. It's basically like they have a surveyor on site, right? Their, their operations team has the ability to lay out lines, lay out slopes, do whatever they want. So they use the rover to keep the machines on task uh you know and whenever they need a survey or or a point set or a slope set instead of calling in a surveyor they break out their rover so that's i'd say you know that's kind of the minimalist customer rover and uh stratus and then we have uh for the machines for the compactors we have uh an indicate system with uh compaction control so that helps the machine operators to construct the cell to design uh it gives them some insight into uh compaction of material um but uh you know it it works off the elevation of the drum so it gives the and and because they have the design it gives the operator really great insight as to where they are in the current uh lift plan you know when are they approaching the slope when they get to the slope how do they build the slope so it allows them to um to take advantage of of all the airspace and and manage the materials appropriately um and then we also have on the dozers uh lots of people will put a full grade control system on their cover dozers and so what we do there is the the compactor is running one design to to pack the material and then the dozer is either offsetting that design or has a design on its own right so maybe you know you may need a foot and a half of uh cover material on the deck and they need two and a half feet on the slopes right so if the compactor compacts the material properly and in the right place right and and they know it's packed properly and they've minimized the air voids and and all that and built it up to the right elevation then when the dozer comes in and puts on the cover material they've put on the right amount of cover material they haven't put on hopefully too much cover material because the, the compactor is built up the bottom to the right area. And so um, so they're just really, you know, complementary tools, depending on like how much uh, a landfill wants to get into managing their materials and their operations, right? They can go anywhere from Stratus alone, Stratus and a rover, uh, add on, you know, compactor machine control or a compactor indicate system, and then dozer full machine control. And that's what makes up the solution. I also have a screenshot there of uh, TBC and the kind of the uh, center uh, up. And TBC is uh, a package that can be used to create designs. Um, and uh, those designs, um, even if they're created uh, by a civil engineer, they can be put into business center, manipulated by 
the landfill. And then we actually have a cloud application, which I don't have listed here, but um, you can get the designs to the machines through the cloud. And that's a program, program called a Trimble Works Manager. So we have data going to the machines uh, through Works Manager. And then we actually have a, a bit of a, an after mapping system called Vision Link, which can give you insight into the daily operations of the machines as well. And I, I don't have a screenshot of that here either. These are these are the tools that make up the solution. So, great, thank you. Yeah. Certainly, certainly um, changed in the last uh, probably last ten years where things have really ramped up, which is excellent. Yeah. All right, and that's the end of our presentation. Do we have any All questions? Right. Yeah, so we've got about five minutes for questions. So, uh, if you guys still want to pop any in that you have, we'll make sure that we can get them answered on this call. And if we can't do that, we will send them in a follow-up email. So the first question we have is uh, from Philip. He's asked, do AeroPoints work with a standard Phantom 4 drone? Um, they do. Um, they work with any drone, basically. It's just a ground target. So as long as it's in the photograph, we're just logging the position of that and you'll get the position of that. So it's basically to replace normal ground control where someone's gone out with a rover. So, yep, so that will be question. just classical aerial triangulation without uh, PPK, though. That would be the difference, but Phil probably knows yeah, that. Yeah, it yep. certainly would be PPK, but it can be used as your normal, yeah, yep. normal. Yep. Great. So we've got another one from Kate, and she's asked, would the volume comparison tool identify pockets of unused airspace? So can you reclaim that? Yep, certainly can. So you can um it's that's used a fair bit by quite a lot of our users already where you can compare the volume especially because the uh, landfill settles you can compare it to the top of waste the final design and very quickly it will highlight in blue what needs to be filled so that's your unused airspace straight away which can amount you know can amount to quite a lot of dollars on that very good uh, we've got another question from Hans. He's asked, does it cost more to have extra users looking at the data? That's a great question. I can answer that, Jim, but it's um, no, it's the same cost. Um, so it, it isn't done on users, it's done on how many flights you actually, you actually fly, so how many surveys. Yep. Okay. Okay. We've got another one from Have you, uh, do you need RTK for high accuracy? So the you don't need RTK. So there's RTK and there's PPK. You need the you need a, a PPK capable drone. And to, the terminology gets a little confusing, but in this case, the Phantom 4 RTK is actually we're using it in a PPK mode. DJI sells it as an RTK uh, drone, but we use it in a PPK mode. So PPK is more robust solution than RTK. Um, RTK is much newer, and I think you know from a marketing perspective, people might get a little confused to think it's better. But um, PPK is actually more robust, and uh, the difference being, well, there's two differences. One, if you're going to do RTK, you need to provide a correction source to the drone in the field. So you need to have some kind of a radio link, and you also have to have some kind of correction source in the field. Um, so there's that part of it. What we do is we do a passive arrow point logging data, we do a passive drone logging data, and then we combine those in the processing. So it's post-processed and not real time in the field. Um, the other uh, benefit is that um, PPK, so if you have what's called a cycle slip, which is where you lose some satellites and you might not have uh, a high accuracy position, an RTK, if you don't have an accurate position, you lost it, you can never get it back. But in PPK, because it's post-processed, we can solve for positions both forwards and backwards through a data set. So if for some reason there's a cycle slip and we lose it going forward, we can go past it in the processing and come back and still get an accurate position. So PPK is a preferable uh, solution for this type of application. Okay, and I think we've got time for just one more. So Greg has asked, how frequently do you see landfills fly their sites? Okay, um, I'll answer from my point of view in Australia. We normally, a lot of landfills start off flying once a month because that's when they're used to getting 
surveyors coming in. Um, but once they get the drone themselves, they find how easy it is to actually fly and ramp it up to every two weeks. So that's typically what I see here is every two weeks, they might fly the whole entire site at the end of the month and then fly the working tip face and the middle bit um, in that middle bit in that second week. So uh, it does definitely ramp up once you can get your drone yourselves. What about yourself, Jim? Yeah, I was going to defer to you since you see the portal and, and the usage. Um, but yeah, once you once you get used to it, uh, I'd say, you know, if the opportunity presents itself at the right time and, you know, if the weather is perfect and, you know, you can get out. I, I fly a landfill quite often under development and testing and I fly about 150 acres. Right. And that takes like an hour from the time I kind of get there till the time I leave. I can do that in about an hour, uh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. So, you know, if you were on site and the opportunity presented itself and you have your methods down, you could fly your site very quickly. So whenever needed, really. All right, I think that'll do it for today. Jim, Kevin, thank you so much for this great presentation and thank you for spending part of your day with us to all of our attendees. Okay, thanks Kelsey. Thanks.